to the Produce on Purpose podcast. This is Randy Atkins, your host. We are always looking to experience life as being the real you. Today, we have a wonderful guest, and she's going to bring her talents and have a great conversation about ways of really bringing in two different kinds of ways of thinking. So uh, over 25 years, we have a Victoria who has had an intersection of academia and executive leadership. Uh, she's dedicated her career to mastering the art of work-life harmony. And a theme that resonates deeply with her is in today's high-pressure environments. So, Victoria, welcome to the Produce on Purpose podcast. And uh, how are you today? I'm doing very well. Thank you. Really happy to be here. So we'll we'll jump right in and just start and really want to you to introduce yourself to our listeners and tell them a little bit about your journey and how you got to where you are today. Well, as you mentioned, I have over 25 years of experience in um, uh, in corporate world. So uh, I spent most of my career in Silicon Valley in uh, different roles in different companies. I worked in a large global corporations. I worked in uh, startups. Uh, I worked in boutique consulting companies, always around technology and innovation. But I started as a psychologist, actually. So um, right off of high school, I really wanted to be a psychologist. So I went and got a degree. I got a master's degree, and then I got a PhD in psychology. And then I started counseling, right? So I started working as a psychologist. And um, about a year in uh, to that career, I suddenly realized that, no, that's not it. I made a mistake. So I followed my passion, and I made a mistake. For sure, it was the wrong uh, field that I went to. So I pivoted into the corporate world, and a few years in, what do you think happened? <laughs> I said, wow, I made another mistake. That's not it either. Uh, so I pivoted again and again and again until I realized that it's actually not the job. It's not really a corporation or a small startup or a big startup or, or a company. It was really that um, uh, what we call a burnout now. So this is like a classic case of a burnout that made me make all those switches um, and, and solve the problem that wasn't really a problem. So now it's really a passion project of mine uh, to help others to go through burnout and uh, make uh, kind of controlled and aware choices of how to prevent this so that um, they don't just switch external circumstances, but they find something inside of themselves that they can really lean on and rely on uh, to figure out what is uh, what is that they need to change uh, to make their lives better. Well, and that's that's really awesome because I know even with the pandemic, it was a very big discussion talking about you know burnout and making sure, especially for the first responders that were around. But, you know, we know that it's not just during the pandemic that we have this issue of burnout that's occurring. And so I, I think it's great that you're able to uh, begin to share that. And sounds like your journey has uh, been an interesting one, which I want to kind of start with. And so I, I didn't say your whole name initially. I think I, I was like, oh, wait a minute. Victoria Mintz is, yeah. is here with us and I appreciate her coming on. So. <laughs> The idea that you started off and you started with psychology and ended up in the corporate world, just to, to take a little time here and, and tell about that, kind of what that feeling was when you started that process, because sometimes we do start, and this is something I share with many over and over again, is that sometimes we'll start things and we'll find out exactly what we don't like, and more so than maybe what we do like yet but trying different things. How was that particular journey? And I know if you can tell a little bit of how you felt and, and then, you know, we know that now you've gotten to a place where it sounds like you found your, your calling and your, your passion. Yeah. So what's interesting about burnout, and I think that a lot of people experience it differently, but there's a common thread in the burnout and that's um, a feeling of exhaustion. Right? It's almost like a chronic exhaustion. So no matter what you do, no matter how much sleep you get, 
you really feel tired for it. So it comes to burnout. <laughs> They're kind of burning the batteries, right? So you're running on empty batteries. Uh, that's what it is. Uh, for me, when I started um, and, and working with people in psychology, I just quickly really got tired. It's like I cannot <laughs> take one more sad story. And I'm very straightforward about this because uh, the, the, the message that I do want to bring that now that I am working with people again, um, you know, in kind of similar capacity, I know that it was not about people. It was really about me not shielding myself, not having tools to uh, replenish my energy. So it's very interesting that you mentioned first responders during um, during pandemic. In general, people in service profession, they um, kind of feel it much faster. I think the burnout itself, the concept of burnout was really born out of the research done on uh, medical professionals, people who work uh, in emergency rooms, uh, and I think a lot of it is really because you're giving away so much, right? So you cannot say that people did not follow their passion. A lot of people in medical professions, they do follow their passion. They want to help, right? They want to save lives. You know, mm -hmm. I was driven by similar, you know, similar um, kind of motives as well. I really wanted to help others. Um, it's, but it's important to have the tools to replenish that energy as well. So it's not a one-way street. You just give but you actually are being able to construct your day, your life, um, your, uh, your attitude, right? So your actions uh, around things that replenish your energy as well. So that's, that's, that's kind of what I figured out later in, in, in life. But at that time, I thought, I just don't want to work with people one-on-one. -on -one. I want to have something a little bit more neutral. And I just looked at um, what skills I have that are transferable to the corporate world. Uh, and I realized that research was one of those skills. So I actually went to in marketing, uh, doing marketing research, and mm -hmm. also um, kind of, um, you know, being able to understand what people are looking for, what their interests are, and how they perceive the messages. So that's also, I found, is a transferable skill in marketing as well. That's, that's interesting because, you know, sometimes we end up with, you know, different skill sets that we learn in different places and trying to align those to kind of help out with the process. One of the things that just stood out to me as you were talking was that burnout, it wasn't exactly sometimes something external to you. So it wasn't the people, but you found that sometimes burnout is uh, more than that. And it also sounds like it could be related to, you know, sometimes it may, it may be something that we're doing physically all the time. There's exhaustion there. Are there multiple levels of burnout that you could end up with? And what would you describe those as so that when I think one of the first steps would probably be to identify, are yeah. you in a place of burnout? What does that look like? Yes. So a burnout is, is kind of, um, how do I say, it's a kind of a heavy state, right? So you, um, exhaustion is one of those. I think that's a red thread that goes through um, kind of recollections of people who, are, who, who can uh, identify burnout in themselves. But um, what burnout is, is a chronic stress reaction. So how you personally react to stress, that's how the burnout is going to manifest. So sometimes it could be changes in behavior like digestion, for example. Like if you lose appetite when you're stressed, that's probably going to be something that you want to look for to figure out whether in burnout or not. Or if you start craving things, um, or if you lose sleep, there's some, you know, sleep interaction, sleep, sleep pattern um, uh, disruptions, and then that could, you know, burnout could manifest that way as well. On a kind of psychological level, you feel tired and you feel unmotivated. Uh, you feel skeptical, right? So you don't want to go and, and do the work. Uh, so there is a little bit of lethargy there, um, lack of energy and things like that. But it's it's individual. So from, from person to person, what your reaction to stress is probably these symptoms will actually, um, you know, kind of um, uh, increase uh, during the burnout. There are tests out there that people can do. So some of them are pretty elaborate. Uh, okay. All of them are free as far as I know. So you, you go into the checklist. But um, it's it's not even even that important to say oh I'm in burnout or I'm not in burnout. 
Uh, mm-hmm. There is a stage where I also, um, you know, very inter- what was very interesting to know, there is another stage, and I think many more people kind of fall into that category. It's called languishing. So, and it's, <laughs> so languishing, you're not quite, okay. yeah, so you're not quite like, happy, right? But you're not quite happy. So you're near the, neither there, neither here nor there. You're somewhere in between. And when somebody asks you, like, how are you doing? How's life? And you go like, meh different day you know same thing <laughs> so i right. think a lot of us uh, would actually fold into this category uh, and i think the 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 irony of kind of being in this category is that uh, when you're in this state you kind of think that this is normal well this is what a lo- adult life is right mm. so this is it um, it's not going to get better it's not going to get worse so you're not even looking for help you're not even trying to change things so I think that kind of the irony of this category and a lot more people fall into that. And um, there is the state of flourishing and um, that we forgot about. And a lot of people don't even put it uh, as a goal for themselves. Like, I'm, right. I'm fine. I'm okay. It's clear, but I'm okay. But there's a state of flourishing when you're actually, um, when, when, when you, um, when life is juicy, right? when the, when the colors are bright, you know, yeah. when you're motivated, when you wake up in the morning, you're motivated, you're excited, right? So you're vibrant. There's a vitality to that. And I think that um, kind of one of the uh, missions that I put in myself is that we put the bar there, right? So mm-hmm. this is our baseline. This is, should be our baseline. We shouldn't settle for languishing. Certainly get out of burnout, get help, get out of burnout, but don't settle for languishing, really kind of raise the bar to yourself. There's no reason for us to not be in that flourishing state. So it sounds like there is, you know, the particular areas you could be in a burnout kind of situation. You could be languishing. You could be in a place where there's flourishing and you're saying flourishing should be the floor and then there's more. So <laughs> I, I, I love that. I, I love the idea that, you know, every day you should wake up with this excitement. Uh, many, many years ago, I um, had a, a eye surgery where you could, I could see better and they um, did that. And when I woke up the next morning, it was very vibrant. You talked about vibrancy. You talked about the color, you know, I could see colors. It was extremely uh, a different life. I was like, wow, I didn't know the world was, could be like this. <laughs> and so now I'm going to now know that, Hey, I can look and see things in a particularly new way. So as we are kind of going through and, and if you don't identify, but if you're kind of going through a daily basis and your floor is not the flourishing. So that means there's obviously more to life. What are some of the Uh, particular tips, uh, first aid tips, whatever you would call them, that you could start working towards helping to get out of a situation where you're probably at burnout or languishing, and maybe even where you're at flourishing, where you can kind of uplift yourself and get to uh, a better place. Right, right. So I, when I talk about burnout, I really like to talk about two levels of uh, tools. And the first one, as you mentioned, is first aid, and it's really related to stress management. So we live in the world, we know, you know, I know, everyone knows, right? That there's so many disruptions, there's so much stress. We stress about everything, about real things and unreal things and imaginary things, just everything to the point that everything that comes at us uh, causes stress. And there is a reason for that. There's lots of disruption and the pace of life is accelerating. There's the technological disruptions. You know, I've been in high tech for an innovation for a long time. We're talking about disruptive technologies and disrupting yourself. So there are lots of disruptions, climate disruptions, who knows, you know, the rain, heavy rain started. So many different things could be political disruptions. The disruptions are not going to go away. So those Mm -hmm. external circumstances are going to happen. We don't know what the certainty is not going away. So what 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 we can master is our own state. And stress management is this first kind of first aid, uh, first response, stress management tools. How do we um, take control over our own 
uh, nervous system, right? So that we're not in this constant survival mode, but we can shift from survival mode to a, um, to a rest and digest mode. And uh, those stress management tools is really the language how we can talk to our survival system. It doesn't understand words. Um, it's just too old for verbal, <laughs> for verbal understanding and communication. Mm -hmm. So it understands the, uh, um, the, the language of breathing, right? Okay. So when we have breathing techniques, uh, and there are very, um, uh, various tools, lots of them out there for breathing. Uh, some of them are very basic. You inhale, uh, for five counts, you hold your breath for five counts, you exhale for five counts and you hold your breath for five counts and you do it five to seven times. It's going to take you a couple of minutes and it immediately, immediately elevates that, um, you know, that, that state of anxiety or frustration or anger and what have you, that the stress management technique, it sends the signal in the language that our survival system understands, sends the signals, um, to calm down. The danger has passed. <laughs> we can move on with our lives. So breathing is one of those languages. Action um, movement is another of those languages. Mm -hmm. It does not have to be, you know, that you need to run a marathon. No, it can be light stretching. It could be you clench and you relax your muscles. That sends a signal to the survival uh, brain to, 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 to calm down, to switch. Um, the uh, uh, visualization images is the language that that brain understands as well. So um, a few minutes of guided meditation, maybe, or visualization of, um, you know, call emotion. And, uh, <laughs> um, so there are so many of them out there. Just go on YouTube, you know, type it out, guided meditation, pick the one that works for you. These are the tools that should be at our disposable at any time. So when you feel overwhelmed, when you feel anxious, when the anger comes up, when the frustration comes up, um, it should be at your disposal. You understand that that's the time to take a few minutes and um, breathe or move or meditate. So that's the first aid, right? So really just to talk to your physiology. And then we're talking about the second level. And the second level is something that can bring more sustainable results and how I actually regulate my mindset and uh that's intentional these are there's a thing this is a practice this is not mm -hmm. one off but it's a practice it practically you make a decision that you live the life you want you make a decision to be happy it's a practice it's not the end goal it's really a journey there mm -hmm. um and one of the first steps that i really like to talk about um is uh, how you bring back joy into your life. How do you carve out space in your life to bring in the things that you enjoy just for the mm -hmm. sake of it, not because somebody asked you to do those things, not because it's useful, not because it brings you money, not because of the return on investment. No, right. you actually do something just for the sake of being happy. And you know, we're not talking about big things. So now I'm going to six weeks vacation or, you know, uh, um, a, a cruise or something where I'm going for a four hours massage or something. No, these are little things that you built into your schedule every day. It could be, um, I go outside for a couple of minutes and I want to feel the sun on my skin. Right. Mm -hmm. And I do it because it brings me joy and happiness. And obviously it's very individual. But um, you do that and you put them in the calendar and you do them intentionally. And that's how you start replenishing your energy. So you make a decision to bring joy into your life and you make that conscious decision that this is as important as everything else. It's as important. The joy is as important as the usefulness. The joy is as important as health. And the joy is as important as your relationship, whatever that is. And that what brings you energy, that what makes you replenish that energy that you spend um, giving others. That's really awesome because the first level, it sounds like it is primarily physiology. I've, I've heard similar, I guess it was really what you explained was box breathing. Uh, you know, it's acute. I have something going on. Uh, I need a first responder. Like if something happens, I call 911. We want this immediate kind of relief from the stress that we have 
And so you do those types of things or movement or some type of meditation that you can kind of get yourself back to that state. Sounds like level one is there. And level two, which is interesting to me because I really do believe part of what we should do every day is should have joy. How do you bring joy? It doesn't have to only be something where you're doing something big, but you talked about you doing small things that kind of gets you in a state that you're, you enjoy and that you're happy with. And I believe that if we can do those things and it sounds like if we can put it into our schedule and you use the word that I love intentionally that you have put in your cell and say, I'm going to have joy and I'm going to take on the tools from level one or whatever, whatever I'm in a state of stress and I'm feeling exhausted. I'm feeling in a space where, you know, things aren't going quite the way that I need them to be. So as we're making these choices and, and intentionally making these types of decisions, how do you get to a point where you know that this is no longer just an acute thing that maybe I'm dealing with? If, for example, you got to a place where you knew you needed to move to different jobs or maybe I need to change my situation. How do you begin to distinguish between when is it just me doing the work and I've done some work, but maybe I do need to begin to change maybe the job I'm at or some of the external situations that I'm dealing with? Yes, it's very interesting. And again, uh, it's, uh, it differs from person to person. Um, all I want to say is that a lot of people that I um, talk to by the, by, by the time they find uh, me, uh, they are ready to quit, right? So this is our first response almost. Like for sure, for me, it was for me. For sure, it was psychology, this counseling that I made a mistake with. For sure, I, well, I worked uh, after that, I worked in the semiconductor company. Uh, doing marketing for sure it's a cynic on that thing <laughs> that's so impersonal that's so convoluted so far away from kind of real need of real people for sure it's that um that that made me um unhappy right uh it could be in a relationship situation for sure it's this person makes me unhappy for sure if i change that then everything else changes so uh in most cases uh, more often than not Yes, you can change the external circumstances, but guess what's going to happen? You take yourself with you. So you're going to repeat the circumstances. Like you're, you're going to get rid of this person, you get in a different relationship, and you run to the same thing because you took yourself with you. You cannot run away from yourself. Mm -hmm. So it's important, I think, to really distinguish this thing. So let's go through the practice Let's get ourselves from a survival mode. Let's put yes. the self-care into our schedule so we actually experience that joy. We prioritize that joy. We prioritize ourselves. We make mm -hmm. a decision to make ourselves happy. Let's get the practice of gratitude when you actually notice things that you like instead of yes. things you don't like. So that's what practice of gratitude is, um, right? So like I intentionally notice things that I like instead of things I don't like. Uh, right. Let's look at where, what it is in your day uh, that um, uh, brings energy to you and what it is in your day that drains energy. Mm. And you put this as a list. Well, these are the things that I really like, I enjoy. They bring um, energy to me. Yes. And these are the things that really drain my energy. So uh, one of the examples from um, my personal experience could be... Um, that uh, in a day, um, I had to do all these things. Some of those were very creative. Some of those were related to talking to people. Some of those were really mundane, mundane when I had to fill out spreadsheets. And I realized that all of all this spreadsheets was the really joy killer for me. So, and then um, you say, well, what do I want to see more of, right? So, right. and you start creating that. You start creating that vision for yourself. And then you start negotiating for that. Where is it that I bring value? Mm -hmm. um, what's my contribution and the value? And how do I bring that value? A lot of us in our busy jobs and our corporate work, um, or as a business owner, as an entrepreneur, we uh, substitute value for time that we spend on things. 
mm-hmm. right? Um, so, and that's sh- a sure road to burnout because there's, there is not enough hours in the day. So where is that value that you contribute? You realize that and you do more of that. And slowly but surely you peel away those things that drain your energy, those things that don't bring value. And you, you learn to say no to those. And in most cases, let me tell you, it's not the job. People who achieve a certain level of success, if they're mm-hmm. in executive capacity, they didn't get there um, if they did not really like their job. Most of the time, they do like their job. It's really everything else that layered on top of that that needs to be cleared so they actually become more productive and motivate the game. Because now they have that harmony. They are in a, in a driver's seat. They decide um, how much of this is job, how much of this is relationship. They have right. life outside of job. It's not just, you know, 100% identity around your job. They have life outside of that. And they can, um, can in every day, they can decide for themselves. They can control when they can put more effort in the job, more effort in the relationship. And everything is just working in harmony. Does that answer your question, Randy? Oh, you answered the question. I believe that a lot of times the question and the reason I ask that question is because we sometimes think it's where we are at the moment. We sometimes think it's the external circumstances. But it sounds like you're saying regardless of if you change your environment, you may have some temporary relief. But in the end, you're still bringing yourself And so if there's items that you haven't worked on, you haven't dealt with, you will end up in a depleted situation once again. And additionally, I I like how you talked about the energy that we end up having that we should think about what gives me energy and what drains my energy. And you said that we should say no to the things that drain our energy. Now, I, that seems to be sometimes difficult for people to identify those energy draining areas. Sometimes those energy draining areas could be family, could be other relationships, could be, you know, things that we have um, been dealing with that don't make us feel the best. How do you begin? And I know they usually call these boundaries that you, how do you begin to say no? In those situations, is it something that you are um, following because now you are having intention about it? Are you more aware of it? Kind of how do you get to that space where you can start to put up those boundaries? Yes, and uh, it's not that easy uh, for a lot of people to say no. Um, So let me answer this in two parts. The first part, I just want to go back to that conversation of value right so what is it the value that you contribute what is the value that you create by performing this particular task and it's especially important in job situation but in the family situation it's the same for example I have kids right so what is where where do I create the the greatest value for them when I do laundry uh, when I clean the kitchen or when I spend time to them reading books or discussing, I don't know, the wonders of the world, right? right. So where is that value that I create that nobody else can replicate? Um, so that's one discussion. The second discussion is that um, um, is this really my business? So if you, I look at all the things that need to be done and how they need to be done, mm-hmm. I think it's important to understand, is this really my business? how they need to be done. A lot of times uh, when we're talking about boundaries, we really are talking about uh, control. Uh, We want to control everything and everyone, that everything needs to be done the way I see it, the way I think about it, the way I would do it. So that's control. 90% of that is unnecessary control. So learning to relinquish that control Learning to relinquish that control, that's the skill. And let Mm -hmm. me tell you where it is that control is coming from. It's coming from fear. So that fear, exactly, that fear that I'm losing something, that, um, you know, the results are not going to be the same, whatever that is. So it's a good question to say, 
what is going, is this going to be important five years from now? How exactly I put that close into laundry? Is it going to be important five years from now? No, because, you know, in, in the, when people come to me, they come as a whole person, not just as a job, but as a whole person. And then their complaints start. Oh, only I can do laundry. No way I can do laundry like I can do laundry. <laughs> It seriously, seriously, yes. people in, you know, um, who spend 90% of their time in jobs, you know, managing tens, you know, hundreds, thousands of people. And then she comes home and says, only I can do laundry this way. Really? Um, but it's really, it's really a fear, right? So the fear that runs that, that something can go wrong. So, so realizing that fear and mm -hmm. understanding, is this really my business? Is this person put a spreadsheet? in a different when, way than I did this. Is this fear real? Is this really my business? And right. a lot of times it's not my business. So the skill is to let it go. And when it feels like when you let it go and it feels like, well, then it was an unnecessary control. <laughs> <laughs> is this my business? <laughs> That's what we need to be asking way more of. <laughs> yeah, is yeah. this my business? Yeah. It sounds like if in, in those situations and like you're talking about, you know, something mundane like laundry or washing the dishes, you know, that sometimes we use that as a, I think, as a crutch or a comfort zone to get into that, you know, does it matter how it's done if it gets done or, you okay. know, a particular result is there. Or is this even, uh, if it's not done my way, did it still get done? And when you let go, like you say, it sounds like there's a, a modicum of a release that we can all have if we learn to find those areas and ask ourselves that question, is this my business? And then be in a space where you can kind of release that control because is am I having fear about something here? of losing something and as sometimes it may be i guess maybe control in other areas of your life that mm -hmm. you may not have control over here but i sure do have control over this laundry or the spreadsheet or or yeah. the or right. the dishes right. which you would say is pretty mundane right right exactly well it's especially you know business owners um people who like very strong people right so they they see how their business should work so they understand right. how it should work they know how they would do it so it's very difficult for them to let go if somebody but at some point for growth you really need to bring other people and you should be open and able to receive that support from others as well if you are not able to receive that support you really cannot grow because there is a limit to what you can do and how you can do this so in the work situation it's the same way right and once you actually in that state, you're going to attract the much more capable people who are willing to help, so are able to help and mm -hmm. to grow and evolve with you and grow your business with you as well. I, I think that's, uh, you know, key is when you are moving to that space, especially when you're in a transition of, especially if you're in a startup and you're doing like multiple different positions, different jobs, and then you're in a place where you're hiring. Now you have to really relinquish that control, train, and then let it go. Let the people do the job and have the responsibilities that they need. So as we've been talking, I, I think we've found ways to somewhat identify some of the stress and the pieces that bring us there. Um, it's, it's interesting because I think we all deal with this work-life balance in our lives and I always hear about balance. So the question becomes, is it work that's causing the imbalance or is it my life that's call it causing the imbalance? <laughs> and so I'm going to ask you, how do we begin down that journey? Even though we may be stressed, we want to get to this balanced place. We want to flourish. What are some tips that we can begin to implement uh, today that will allow for us to start to have that balance and, and mm -hmm. move in that direction. Yeah. So thank you, Randy. Uh, and there, there is this notion of balance. I really like to think about it as a harmony because when I think balance, I, I, I kind of picture, um, 
scale, right? So there's work here and there's life there. And if there's less of this, there's more of that, right? So it's, it's a little more restricted. When we talk about harmony, it's kind of this fluid state that you control, you know, when you dial up this part, you dial down that part, um, and everything is just works the way you design, how you designed it. So the skills that we discussed today, you know, self-care is that's only that skill because that brings joy, right? So the value of joy and you use hurt, uh, respecting and valuing your unique skills and your talents, and you are, um, giving validation to your desires, right? It's important. Your unique desires are important. It's not just the job that you do, but everything else that you came with. There are all these different parts. The gratitude that we we're talking about, when you're intentionally you train yourself to see things that you like instead of things that you don't like. Um, you know, the balance, uh, not the balance, the boundaries, the relinquishing of control. Um, is this my business, not my business? Receiving help. These are the skills. These are the skills that actually elevate your state to that state of flourishing. And you start looking at all these different components of flourishing. Income is very important. Financial um, stability is very important. But there are other things there as well. Relationship is very important. Your purpose is very important. And that sense of harmony is important. All these different elements, your health and vitality is important, right? So that's the harmony part. It's not just work and life. Your right. whole being and your whole being with all these different parts. And that's why you start designing that. But what I want to tell you, and that's my experience, and this is really on the level of miracles. Once you start practicing these skills, you will actually see changes almost immediately. You start putting joy into your life. You start uh, being grateful for what you have, what you like. Um, you start relinquishing the unnecessary control, you actually will see uh, miracles right away. And the most interesting part in that miracles is that mm -hmm. people start mirroring that. <laughs> so around you, you're actually, you're actually um, getting, um, you will be surrounded, you will be bathing in gratitude mm -hmm. that people will re return back to you. You will be bathing in that joy. You actually elevate everything around you. So that's, that's how we start changes, and that's how your changes, your internal changes, change your external circumstance. I, I love it, and I, I talk about this all the time as I'm sharing, as we talk about Produce on Purpose, is that these external items that we have in life, they're there, but we have the ability to allow that internal to be able to flow outward. Sounds like you've given us some some really cool tips, gratitude, making sure that we are intentionally being joyful and really you hit on it. I'll give you a moment to talk about it. How does purpose fit within this and understanding your purpose fit within uh, this construct that we're talking about on a daily basis of having that joy, having that, that place of gratitude? How, how does that fit? And you talked a little bit about value, but it does value mm -hmm. fit within that purpose conversation? Yeah, so I think you probably um, can talk more about purpose than I can talk about purpose since the whole, <laughs> your whole work is really about producing on purpose, right? Um, so where in, in, in my uh, view, where it fits is um, when you ask the question, why, right? So my purpose could be different from yours, but it's really driven by that by why question. Um, for better or worse, again, this is just the way of the world. <laughs> We're being bombarded since the um, you know early ages of what we should be, what we should do, what's important, what's not important uh, by society, by parents, by schooling, everything to the point when you don't hear your 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 true authentic voice anymore, right? Mm -hmm. But it's there. It didn't go away. You just didn't give it a voice. You kind of you know stopped listening. And um, asking why, it's like, I want to have this, you know, new latest car. Why? Well, right. because it's fast. Why? And mm -hmm. you go and go, go until you actually hit something that's real. So when you hit something that real, that's, you know, that's your value. And that probably will translate into a purpose. Um, so what's good about this, again, is this enormous sense of empowerment there. Uh, because you control that, right? So you know that it's yours and nobody else's. 
Um, so I want that car, not because somebody, when I was 10 years old, somebody said that only cool guys have these cool cars, but I know this is for a real reason, authentic reason. Mm-hmm. And likelihood that you won't have that, you know, you won't want that car anymore, but you want something else. Um, but once you hit that why that's authentic to you, that translates into purpose, so then you actually, it's not something that you want to do, but it's something that you must do, right? <laughs> so that's right, becoming yeah. that driven factor. Like, this is something you must do because nobody else can do that. And I want to help the world. So I want to share that. Uh, and it's a, it's a huge, great motivating factor. And that really contributes is that sense of flourishing. So I'm doing something important. Awesome. And, and Victoria, I really have enjoyed this conversation. And so I'm going to ask this, this question. I love to ask that if you would share three tips that you would provide to the audience of the items that they should go ahead and utilize that you've done over your entire life that you figured out, I think these are treasures that you feel that you should, everyone should know about. What would those be? Mm-hmm. So I'll give one tip because I really was a, a page turner for me uh, uh, around the around the self care, right? So I was in this really deep state of uh, burnout, unmotivated. Um, really did not want to go to work anymore. It's just uh, really questioning. So what is this for? I checked all the boxes. I did everything that everybody ever asked of me. So what? <laughs> Why mm-hmm. am I still not happy? Uh, and somebody suggested this exercise about self-care. So the exercise that you put together a list of 20 things that you like to do. Again, mm-hmm. not because somebody told you that they are useful, not because, you know, they'll make you senior or, you know, healthier or anything, not because they bring you money, none of that, just because you like doing them. It could be silly right. things, mm-hmm. um, uh, but just do that. Um, let me tell you my experience. When I tried to put a list of 20 of those together, it took me two weeks to complete. Two weeks. I stopped in number three and I mm-hmm. looked around and said, oh, I don't remember anymore what I like. Ooh, I wow. truly have no idea. I forgot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so it took me two weeks. I actually had to go back, way back. It's like, what did I like when I was seven years old? <laughs> to dance. I like to sing, you know, I like to run. I like yeah. all those things. What did I like when I was 16? What did I like before I had kids? So I actually had to go down the memory lane and push those out um, of myself. Like, oh, I really like to play tennis. Hmm. I remember. <laughs> yeah. But it took me, it took me two weeks to complete. So it will be a very powerful experience. If you, uh, if you do that and you put together a list of those 20, do your best um, just things that bring you joy and then take three of those and put them on the calendar every day for the next week. Um, awesome. you'll go back, you'll go back a week, um, from now and you see, wow, that really changed my life. That's awesome. I appreciate that tip uh, and, you know, everyone take a look at that and put down those 20 items. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do that too. I'm gonna take that challenge and hopefully share that with others that I know to take that challenge, put it down. What brings us joy? Victoria, how can we find you and how can people connect with you? You can find me on LinkedIn, Victoria Mensch. Uh, you can find uh, all the presentations that I do, all the content. If you want to chat about the burnout, um, how to get out of the burnout, the languishing and the tools and the ways and retreats that we do and the programs that we have, you can book an appointment through LinkedIn as well. I'm very happy to connect with uh, anyone who would reach out on those topics. Victoria, thank you so much for being a part and sharing. You you shared a, a wealth of information, helping us with stress, helping us to understand burnout, helping us to move from that place that we call burnout to languishing, and hopefully you're at the floor of flourishing. I really enjoyed all of our conversation, and good luck to you and all that you continue to do, and I appreciate it. Thanks, everyone, and everyone continue to produce on purpose.